Well, it's very nice to be here today. Um, it's very nice that the university is taking this kind of thing important, as important and something we should consider. And I've been asked to talk on this theme of constructivist perspectives on learning. And clearly, as people who have a role in facilitating learning and in teaching, this is something we need to think about from the teacher's perspective, although primarily I'm going to be talking about a learning theory. Now, something to say about constructivism is you'll sometimes see references to constructivisms. Some of you may have already come across that. The idea that although this term is a very widely used term, like a lot of these terms, different people mean somewhat different things by it. Having briefly address that, I can talk a little bit about why I think of some of the core notions on learning that come from constructivism and what the implications from a constructivist model of learning might be and therefore moving towards what we might understand constructivist teaching to be. And in a way you've already been thinking about that, I've had a quick preview of some of the questions here and this is the kind of thing I know that's on some of your minds already. So in terms of constructivisms, I'm not going to say a great deal about this, but just to kind of clarify when you're doing some reading. Um, Primarily, we're thinking about constructivism as being a learning theory, or perhaps a number of learning theories, uh, slightly different people have proposed. And the kind of theory I'm primarily talking about today is sometimes referred to as personal constructivism, or pedagogic constructivism, or psychological constructivism. And although different people use those terms, they're talking about the same kind of thing. You'll also see references to social constructivism and constructionism, and sometimes those terms seem to be used interchangeably, although they do tend to have slightly different meanings. And you'll also see references to constructivism not as being about learning in a teaching situation, but as being about epistemology more generally. And perhaps because of that, you'll also see people talk about constructivism as a kind of paradigm or approach or philosophy supporting research methods. Now, I'm not going to be talking about these two today, and I'm not mainly going to be talking in detail about those two. Um, that's where the focus is, although I would point out that that's not because I have a problem with these two. If we had a lot more time, we could look at some of the differences here. Some people see these things as being somewhat in opposition to each other. I am more of a clumper than a splitter in that regard. I tend to see these things as, as overlapping. And I don't see that social constructivism is against personal constructivism. I think it's just there's a slightly different emphasis. And so I think if you are a social constructivist, to my mind, it doesn't mean you're not a personal constructivist, you're just focusing somewhere else in the system. And I'll say a little bit more about that as we go through, but I'm not dismissing those two. I'm just saying, well, this is really the, where my approach has been focused. I'm not going to say anything about these two at all unless anybody wants to ask me about these later. I'm pointing that out simply because when you do your reading, if you come across the term constructivism in various contexts, it may not be talking about teaching and learning primarily. It might be talking about how we go about knowledge generally or how we go about doing research generally. I think we can say that, um, to my mind, constructivism is a, a notion of learning that sees learning as something that's a personal process, an active process, and basically involves the individual making sense of things. So I think that's where the core of constructivism is. Just because it's an active process, that doesn't necessarily mean a deliberate process. Now, I think when you're thinking about how you use these ideas in teaching, you certainly want to encourage your learners to be deliberate in what they're doing, to think about their learning, to develop metacognition about the learning processes and so on. But the actual theory of how we learn isn't necessarily saying we only learn when we're deliberately trying to learn. We often learn incidentally, and a lot of our learning may be at an implicit level. But it's active in the sense that there's some kind of co cognitive processing going on. It isn't just that the mind is receiving information and kind of imprinting it without any kind of processing. So it's active in that sense. And the fact that I talked there about an individual goes back to what I said about my focus being on personal constructivism. That isn't to suggest this learning has to go along, uh, go on in isolation. Much learning takes place in a group context, maybe in a classroom context, but certainly with involvement from other people, either directly or through media, through reading and so on. So it isn't suggesting that an individual goes and learns without any input from anybody else, quite the opposite but rather that fundamentally there are processes going on within the individual mind, within the individual brain, and that's how learning takes place. So this is right to a psychological perspective. Now, to my mind, what I've just said to you seems really obvious. And I suspect it's obvious to some of you as well. 
Um, if you've read much about teaching and learning over the years, you've probably come across these ideas many times. But we all seem to, as we grow up, develop some very naive motions, notions that we operate on, um, folk theory, if you like, of how mind works. So don't, anyone here from a psychological background? You might have come across the idea of theory of mind. We will have come across the idea of theory of mind. The fact that a normally developing child starts to develop this notion that some other regularities in my environment have minds. You know, the cupboard probably doesn't have a mind. Mummy probably has a mind. Maybe teddy bear has a mind. You know, and then as they get older, they start to think maybe teddy bear doesn't actually have a mind. You know, maybe the dog has a mind, not sure. And maybe mummy's mind's a bit like mine, but I start to understand she may know things different to what I know even though we both have minds. So you go through this kind of process. Now, one outcome of this process, I think, is that we grow up with some very naive notions about teaching and learning, if you like, folk notions. And if you talk about to teachers in schools, this language is very dominant, that teaching and learning is a bit like transfer of information, that we kind of implicitly think that what happens is there are things in the environment that have meaning attached to them, and what we do as people, because we have minds, is we recognise that meaning and therefore we come to know things. And sometimes that's perhaps reasonable. If you go out and you see a bus coming down the road, maybe you might say, oh, there's a bus. And somebody might say, well, yes, the, that object you identified does have a meaning. It is a bus and you recognised it, well done. You know, but then a bus is a kind of a constructed, designed, engineered thing to a particular purpose, created by other human beings. When somebody sees a large rock, when they're out walking and they're tired and they decide to use it as a seat, they've conceptualised that as a seat, but it's not inherently a seat. Um, it's a rock, but who's to say what a rock inherently is? So as human beings, we create meanings to things. So the idea that we recognise the meaning that exists in things is rather naive, because mostly what we're doing is we're imposing meanings on things. Sometimes the meaning we're imposing is aligned with the meaning other people are imposing. Sometimes not so much. Sometimes the meaning we're imposing is aligned with the meaning somebody else intends us to impose. That's hopefully happening when you're reading a textbook or, or giving a lecture or something, but it doesn't always happen. And I think as a, as a teacher, there's this idea that the children didn't learn everything we wanted them to, to learn. This happens in, in school teaching, which is my background. Um, and two things can happen. We teach the children and either they gain knowledge or they don't. And, you know, if they gain knowledge, we're a good teacher, we communicated well, and if they don't, something's gone wrong in the system somewhere. Whereas, in fact, what we actually find is what tends to happen is not that children learn or don't learn when there's teaching going on, or even that children learn some of what was meant to be taught and not all of it, but they tend to learn things that are actually different to what was intended to be taught. They hybridise what's being taught with their existing understanding. So they come up with different understandings, different meanings from those intended. So in reality, a constructivist believes that there's a process of interpretation that goes on, that when we perceive things in the environment, and that includes a lecture or reading a book or watching something on Moodle, that we have to impose the meaning on it, and we have to do that by interpreting it in some way so we come to understand it. Um, and this relies on there being some kind of cognitive system. So the brain, works in a particular way. The brain is not magic. It's not a magic machine for understanding the world. It's a machine that has to process data, and therefore it has strengths and weaknesses and limitations. And it also means that for the brain to work, it has to have resources to interpret things. If you were able to clone a human being fully grown, but without any experience of the world, they would have very limited resources for making sense of things. Any one of us who's lived in the world a number of years has an enormous resource to interpret things based on our past experience. So this is what we need in order to make sense of anything. Now, when children are first born, they seem to be hardwired to understand certain things. They seem to understand some things about permanence of objects, and some, they seem to recognise faces very, very easily as if it's hardwired in. But virtually everything else is, is largely about how experience makes us think. You know, so maybe I'm here talking about making sense, and I'm assuming that you have the right interpretive resources and you're processing this in the appropriate way to know exactly what I mean by making sense. But that is an assumption. It could be wrong. Now, three key words, I think, in the nature of, of learning from a constructivist perspective. One is that learning is incremental. 
because learning requires, certainly active, deliberate learning, requires focusing on things using our working memories, which are of extremely limited capacity. Although working memory is an odd thing, because when we talk about capacity, its capacity isn't like the capacity of a car boot or the capacity of a trouser pocket, in the sense that it can take a certain volume of material. It takes a certain number of chunks of information. And a chunk of information that you're unfamiliar with might be quite small, whereas the things that you're already well familiar with, it can treat enormous amounts of information as if it's one chunk. But when we come to meeting new things, we have a very limited capacity. So we can say that working memory puts severe constraints on the amount of new material we can cope with. Learning occurs through a series of additions of quite small grain size, and that these learning quanta, the students can process being small, limit things because there's no queuing system. So, I mean, I'm not an expert on exactly how the brain works, but I do know that most of the sensory information we take in gets filtered out and doesn't get passed to higher levels. And the things that do get sent into the kind of the little buffers ready to get into working memory have a very limited lifetime. So if more information is coming in that gets pushed into those buffers, before the original information is attended to, it just gets lost. So we don't notice that much. So our processing system processes a very limited amount of information. So if you go to a lecture that's about, if you're, if you're an expert on art history, and you go to a lecture about some specific topic in art history, and it's framed in terms of ideas and concepts and pictures and artists you know, you can probably learn a lot from it because you're using that existing knowledge to structure things. If you know nothing at all about art history and you sit for an hour of expert talk on art history, you may come away having enjoyed it and with an impression and some key ideas, but it's very unlikely you'll have a whole load of detail because you simply can't process things that quickly. So we, things can easily be lost from the system. As already said, learning is interpretive. So we can't directly communicate meanings. Because language is such an effective system that works so often, we get used to the idea that when we say something, somebody who speaks our language will understand what we mean. And of course it often goes wrong, but the fact it's, it works so much of the time is why we're sometimes caught out when it goes wrong. So meaning making takes place in the mind of the person being communicated to. They have to make sense of the hand waving and the pointing and the words and the phrases and the intonation and the body language and everything else, the pictures we draw next to our words on the board. Um, and it relies upon the interpretive resources that person has already got. So if we're assuming their interpretive resources aren't there, the learning we're hoping for is probably not going to happen. And if you put these two things together, it says learning's very iterative. So for an individual learner, you use your interpretive resources to make sense of new things, which means you understand them in terms of what you already know. And so you're, you're pushing your knowledge in particular directions due to what you already know. And if you have a very strong understanding of a topic area, expert understanding, you can learn new information very effectively because of that. If you have strong misconceptions, alternative conceptions in some topic area, they will probably guide your new learning, so it will be misconceived as well. So the idea that when somebody teaches or comes to communicate with somebody else, we have one of these two outcomes, successful communication of intended learning, or no learning took place, or you know, something in between in terms of some of the learning took place but not all of it, is too simplistic because what actually happens is people develop an understanding based on the things they already have available to make sense of what we're telling them and what we're showing them and what we're asking them to do. Now I say, to me, that's now common sense because I've been so used to dealing with these ideas for so long. To some of you that will seem common sense as well, perhaps, because you'll realise this from your teaching. Others may say, oh, I hadn't quite thought about it that way. In my area, which is science education, there's been lots of research about this because it became realised that students usually have alternative conceptions of the ideas they're taught in school. Um, so one of the most famous ones is Newtonian physics about how forces affect motion. Most people intuitively have a different version of how that works that doesn't fit with the physics. Studies show that seems to be the same throughout the world in different cultures, and it still seems to be the same for most students when they've actually learned the school physics. And often the best we can hope for is that they sometimes use the right ideas when the questions are posed in particular ways on a good day with a following wind, and other times they'll, they'll go back to their pre-existing ideas. Um, there's plenty of other ideas that have been found in science that misconceptions people have, you know, but all sorts of things. In some cultures, if you sit under a certain tree, you get pregnant, apparently. I don't know what else happens under the tree, but that's what they say. If you're under that tree, you get pregnant. Uh, some of these ideas 
don't seem to be particularly important for learning because simply when you teach people the correct idea, the idea they're meant to learn in the curriculum, they say, oh yes, that's fine, that makes sense, I'll go with that. Other ideas aren't so easy to shake. And there's probably at least four different dimensions which are important. Um, an obvious one is about acceptance. You know, it matters how much you are committed to an idea. We can all know things in the sense that we know they're out there without believing in them. Um, I'm sure there's all kinds of fads and odd religious ideas and cultural things that you all know about that people are throwing salt over your shoulder. I can't remember, what you, that's when you, is it when you spill something you throw salt over your shoulder? Yeah? I mean, how that helps, I don't know. I was told you should never put your shoes on the dining table. Okay, I can see the sense of that, you know, but that's just common sense, isn't it? Hygiene. You know, I'm not sure there's anything to do with bad luck. If you break a mirror, you have seven years bad luck. Well, maybe if you're the kind of person that goes around breaking mirrors, you're going to carry on tripping over things and knocking into things, but, you know. So most of those things we're not very committed to. But, of course, some people get very committed to certain things. Um, Trump's been told that uh, apparently the Russians were trying to aid his campaign in the American elections. Um, and he knows that, but apparently doesn't believe that is the case. So how we believe in things is important, not just knowing things. How connected things are. If you are told some vague idea about something that doesn't really fit with anything else and it just sticks in your mind, and then years later, and this has happened to me on a number of occasions, you find that this little fact you knew turns out to be completely false. It's probably not that difficult to dislodge that fact if it's just something isolated. If it's at the core of something you believe and strongly connected to everything else, much harder to shift. There's also an issue about multiplicity, as I mentioned with the example of children learning about forces. Just because somebody has the interpretive resources to understand some teaching in one particular way doesn't necessarily mean they don't also have interpretive resources to understand the same teaching in a different way. And perhaps if you started with a different example, you started a different language, or perhaps if they hadn't had an argument with their wife on the way to, way to the lecture, or if they were watching a different television programme last night, different resources might have been brought to mind, and they might have understood something quite differently. So when you test learners to see if they have understood correctly, you might find out that they are capable of understanding correctly. It doesn't mean that's what they're going to think of if it comes up in the exam six months later, as we all well know. So sometimes people have multiple ways of thinking about things. And the other thing is about explicitness. A large amount of our knowledge is implicit, tacit. And that knowledge is very important. I mean, uh, there's a lot of work in science about, um, for instance, when people do, supposedly in science, when you have a new experiment that shows some new result or some new technique, you report it in the literature and it's objective process because anybody else who follows that report can follow this experiment and get the same results. That's the objectivity of science. In practice, research suggests that often when it's a new technique, it doesn't work in anybody else's lab. People actually have to come and look and fiddle with the apparatus themselves and see what you're doing because you're twiddling in particular ways, you're not even aware you're twiddling, apparently. So implicit knowledge is very important. But of course, the problem with explicit knowledge is we're not aware of it. It's acting in the background. It's the thing that gives us intuition. And intuition can be very powerful and can be very correct. But because we don't quite understand what the, the argument is behind it, there's no logical train of thought. There's no rational links. We can't critique it in a way we can have more explicit knowledge. So people's ideas about the world, uh, certainly a lot of this in science, I'm sure it applies in any other academic area at all, have all these different kind of aspects to them. And clearly, if somebody is aware of something but doubts it, it's an isolated fact, it's only one of their many ways of thinking, and it's something they can reflect upon, it's probably going to be easier to change their minds and shift their thinking than if things are down the other end on the other poles. And that brings us to a kind of core question, which I'm hoping that you're going to be able to answer for me, because you're all teaching. Um, what does constructivist teaching look like? Um, perhaps, from what I've been saying, it might make sense to say that the best kind of constructivist teaching is, the, you know, if you're Alexander the Great and you can afford to have a well-known philosopher as your, as your tutor, a one-to-one, -one, and then you can have a good old dialogue and somebody can understand the way you're thinking about things. That's not always possible, though the Cambridge system does try and you know, approximate to that sometimes. But realistically, teaching isn't always going to be like that. But you know, maybe group works better, or maybe it's about getting people to do things. I mean, constructionists would say there should always be some kind of developing of an artefact of some kind. Um, 
Maybe like Rousseau, we should take Emile out into the nature and let him follow his own interests because interests are very motivating. If people really want to learn about something, they probably will. Maybe work-based um, learning because then people are actually into, integrated into the workplace, involved in what's going on, not just learning about it academically. Um, but maybe we can still teach through Moodle. Um, who knows, maybe we can still teach through lectures. Somebody's asking that, I think, on these sheets. And um, maybe, yes, we can teach by writing textbooks and other materials. But in some of those ways, it's easier to be a constructivist teacher than others. This is the challenge of constructivist teaching. That to be a constructivist, you have to take into account the learner's starting points. And if you are a tutor to a future world leader, and you have all day, every day to work with that student, that's an easy thing to do. When you're going in to teach different groups, different times of the week, large numbers, very hard to do that. But it does mean you need to use diagnostic assessment. So you need to find out where the students are at the start before you start teaching them. And you also have to think about the logic from the student's perspective. Because when you're an expert in the subject, it has a structure, it has a logic, there's a disciplinary structure. But often for a learner who's starting out or less experienced, they may not be in a position to understand that fully, and different starting points may make sense to them. Mostly, though, you need to make links with prior knowledge, because you want learning to be meaningful learning. They've got to relate it to the things they can use to interpret what you're telling them, examples they know about, um, analogies they can relate to, things like that. And this rather odd picture is based on an idea by somebody called Lev Vygotsky, and Lev Vygotsky um, looked at learners and he said that uh, if you want to know what's important about a particular learner, it's not what he called the, lear, the um, zone of actual development, that's the inner part of these pictures that's important, that's the bit that the student already has proficiency. So if you have a, a class of you know, school children who can all do sums very easily, you can keep them busy for an hour by giving them a lot of sums to do. They're all working in their zone of actual development. But there's not a great deal of learning going on. He defined an area around that called the zone of proximal development or zone of next development, which is outside the individual's current proficiency to work alone, but an area where they can make progress if they're given sufficient support, sufficient scaffolding, either by a teacher or a more experienced peer or something like that. And so he was saying, this is where you teach. You teach in this zone of next development, not so far away from children's proficiency or learners' proficiency that they can't manage anything and they just end up watching the teacher do it, but not in the area of things they can all do well already, but rather this between area where with the right kind of support, the right kind of scaffolding, they can start to make progress. But what my pitch is meant to represent is that every person in the class has a different existing zone of proficiency, background knowledge, understanding, and a different zone around that of what they might be ready to go on to next. And I think that's an enormous challenge for all teachers. I don't have an easy solution to that. I'm, if you were hoping I was going to give you one, but that's the real challenge. Um, a constructivist teacher takes into account those limitations of cognitive processing we've been talking about. So digesting, digestible learning quanta, things that an individual learner can make sense of at one go. And also tries to build on this idea of scaffolding of what can you do to support a learner outside their comfort zone. Um, and maybe one thing you can do, in this even worse pun type diagram is building on their existing knowledge. It's commonly talked about how you put in place scaffolds that structure learning so you can give people support through the process that gradually you can dismantle and develop their proficiency. But just as important is putting some planks down before you put the scaffolding poles in. Because often, as teachers, we know what the background knowledge is, we know what people are meant to know, and we may have even done a diagnostic assessment and checked they do know these things. And therefore, we assume that when we make our presentation, they'll be linking to that background knowledge in an appropriate way to do the building up of new knowledge. Sometimes we actually have to do something that brings their attention to the relevant prior knowledge and helps them put it in the right kind of shape as suitable foundations for what they're going to do next. So don't just assume that because you're talking about this, this is obviously related to last week's lecture or what they did last year or what they did at school, because it may not be so obvious for the learner. And we also need a formative assessment. Because this process of learning is an iterative process, we can't just find out what they know at the start and assume, therefore, we can move forward because there's a lot of possibilities of things going wrong. It's a chaotic system. You know, if we could perfectly understand 
everything about a person's existing knowledge and understanding, in theory, we'd know exactly how to teach them forward from that point. But we never can know that. There's always going to be big errors in what we can know about a learner's understanding at the moment. And therefore, there's potential for things to spiral away from where we're intending. So we need to keep testing assessment. Now, now when I say assessment, that doesn't necessarily mean give them tests. Often it just means talk to them. Sometimes it just means looking around the room, looking at their faces to see if they're looking totally asleep or bored or completely aghast at what you're saying to them. But looking for the feedback that they're making sense of things and checking their understanding. So be interactive, be responsive, be dialogic. Have teaching that takes into account the learner's ideas. Don't just present the official curriculum version, but find out what they're thinking, explore what they're thinking, and see if you can find ways to take that forward. Um, and this is a rather odd diagram, but it kind of says the teacher starts with a model of the learner's existing understanding. And I think whenever you plan a lesson, you're doing that. Whenever you plan a, a lecture or a group work or whatever you plan, you're kind of assuming you know where the students are at to start with. You're either doing that explicitly and deliberately, or you're just making assumptions in the background. Clearly, it's more likely to be successful if you're explicitly thinking about that. So your model design or, or helps you design what you're going to do to present to students or get the students to do something that should bring about learning. That activity will work with, their learn with the students' knowledge structures, existing knowledge structures, and will develop them. But then you need to see how that has changed through what you've done to see where you're going to go next. So that rather complicated diagram is just meant to be a simple way of showing this is an iterative process. Because learning is an iterative process, teaching has to be an iterative process, where you're continuously seeing are the students where I think they should be? Have they understood what I think they should have understood? Are they bringing forward the background knowledge that should be relevant here? And I haven't said how you do that, but that's, that's open. Um, but that's what you need to do. Now, when I was a school teacher, one of the things I used to do in order to help students understand key ideas is what I called drip feed, which meant I would continuously go back to key points in the subject, I used to teach chemistry and physics, and I continuously go back to key points in all sorts of different lessons, reminding them of things or checking they knew things, even if they weren't central to that particular lesson, but if they were central to the subject, I'd keep bringing them in and going back to them. Now, I now work with graduate students, and I do much the same kind of thing. In different lectures, I'll go back to the same diagrams and the same key points and the same definitions, and I'm waiting for them to say, oh, we've done that to death, move on. And they don't usually. And so I think that drip feed method, even at you know, graduate level, sometimes that's still needed. That keep going back and reinforcing those key ideas, those key points. Provide integrative and synoptive activities. Things that get them to see how knowledge fits together, how topics fit together, how subjects fit together. Because then they'll be actively processing and thinking about the learning. Do what you can to engage them in active processing. and. If you can do project-based work, problem-based work, if you can use workplace learning, group work, all those kind of things can help. But of course, they're not always possible. So even if you're working in a much more traditional lecturing situation, try and teach in a way that encourages questioning, encourages active sense-making, and uses some kind of diversity. Um, the students are all very different. Some of them will respond well to listening. Some will read better. Some will like pictures. Some won't be so keen on pictures. Gestures will help some. Um, some will like analogies more than others. Try and feed different things into your teaching. This kind of thing can be helped if you do things like group work. Because as I said, I'm a personal constructivist. People working together can form a dialogue that helps the learning process. Each individual there has to process the material, but working with others can help that. And the constructionists would say it's best if you even have a, a public outcome. So if a group is working and they know they've got to present to a larger group at the end, or they know they've got to hand something that's going to be marked, or they've got to put a video up on YouTube or something like that, that helps because there's something tangible as an outcome. But, of course, that's not always possible. So the question is, how can we try and follow this kind of process even when our teaching involves providing a book for someone to read um, getting them to watch a video on Moodle, or, um, or just preparing lecture notes for them to come and, and, and listen to a lecture. Because sometimes we are going to be limited to working in that kind of approach, particularly if you've got 200 people in your class. You know, th that rather limits what you can do with a limited amount of resource. So I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer that question. 
Because my answer is, well, it could be all kinds of things. There are some principles you can apply, and ideally, in an ideal world, we probably wouldn't try and teach people complex subjects by putting large numbers in a place and standing at front and talking at them. But realistically, often we do have to do that just from pragmatic considerations. So if we are going to do that, how can we do that in ways that, that build upon some of the things I've been talking about? And obviously, many of you might come across clickers, for instance. Have, have any of you used clickers in, in lectures? Where you pause every now and again, and you ask, pose a question, and the students have to think and press a button, and it comes up that 38% you know, said C. You know, a bit like a Chris Tarrant coming in there and saying, you want to ask the audience. You know. um, things like that can actually make it more interactive. So although you're, you're having to work in a lecture format, it isn't simply one person standing, talking, other people making notes on the assumption that knowledge is somehow being transferred from the teacher's mind via a blackboard or a whiteboard into student notes and into their brains. Because we all know that that is not an effective way of learning. Most of us had to learn that way, but I think most of us probably put in some time outside that to make sense of those lecture notes and talk to other people about what was going on and ask questions. So... It's a bit of a cop-out, but I'm afraid that's my answer.